Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video. Today we're going to have a lot of fun because we're going to do some natural patterns and dots and all sorts of fun things and make your creatures look more real. Let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vincey V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vincey V style. So I'm painting up this fun little frogman. Uh, he's a cool 3D print. I don't know. I just liked him. I thought he was just pretty awesome. But and, and you can see the state he's in right now. He's, you know, we got a lot of colors on and stuff. But the reality is natural creatures like frogs and other things, you know, animals, often have lots of patterns. They're not simply monotone. Uh, and so we want to help bring that to life. So in this video, I'm going to take you through several different methods of doing kind of natural patterns on things to both make things look more realistic and cool. Let's start with the frog himself. And if we're going to do the frog, what we're going to do is we're going to start with research. So here's a couple pictures of frogs that I pulled up. Uh, you know, some are pretty simple, like Mr. Bullfrog, but some are a lot more colorful and have neat, neat patterns like poison dart frogs and stuff. So there's lots of different uh, natural patterns and things we can draw on. And when you're researching or thinking about your color schemes or how you want to do things, Always start with nature as inspiration. That's going to make your work the most credible, interesting, and simply, you know, what people expect. So they'll more, uh, they'll believe it more easily. You don't have to limit yourself to that. We're not going to recreate anything directly. We're just using it for inspiration. So now that we've got some ideas, let's get to the desk and start painting. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pick some colors. So these are the colors that I picked to help liven up my frog. Uh, so we've got a wide selection of very bright colors. As we saw with like the poison dart, dart frogs, a lot of times natural creatures have these cool bright colors and what a great chance to use this awesome set from Rogue Hobbies. If you haven't picked up the Rogue Hobby set yet, don't forget there are uh, affiliate links down below that you can use to pick that up and even save yourself some money and it gives the channel a little kickback. But this is the colors we're going to use. And so my first step is going to be actually to lay down some bright tones. And this is the first thing I'll say. When you're trying to work over your uh, existing color, so you know, you're painting a tiger and you wanna put some stripes on or, or whatever, oftentimes it can be helpful to reset the color to neutral before you try to lay down a tone. If I had tried to put the magenta over the green, it would have looked very weird and desaturated and dark. So instead I start by marking out the pattern with this general sort of white tone. And, you know, any neutral tone will work, but the brighter it is, the more it will help the brighter colors actually shine through later. I work my way around his head, put some splotches on his arms and other places like that. Now, one of the keys here is you want to be sort of very random. So you'll notice I break it up, create a lot of visual noise. Not all of the pattern connects. I sometimes have little dots that are of varying sizes that are separated from the main body of the splotch or whatever we're going to call it. And you want those splotches and things to be of different size, to be of different shapes, and it's going to be hard. Your human brain wants everything to be symmetrical and normal and aligned and, and even, and that is wrong. We can't do that. So we have to fight our own brains and we have to make sure that we're breaking it up. We create dots of different size, densities of the number of dots, how we spread them out, all of those kinds of things. And that will be relevant throughout this entire process. Once I've got the lighter color down, I then move to the magenta. That's what this color is ultimately going to be. And I lay down uh, some of the magenta, just basically painting over all of the white spots I did before. Now, one of the nice parts about this is that if you happen to extend the magenta a little farther than your original dot or something like that, that's okay, because it will just create a little natural tonal variation in the dot and help our later highlighting with the steps we're about to do. But all I do is make sure that I get a nice even coat of that magenta over uh, the white color that I laid down. And the advantage here is it'll go on crisp, bright, and smooth because of that undershading. Once that's done, I then start mixing in a little bit of my original white to just create some highlights on the shape, which is the next thing I want to tell you. When you're doing these sorts of patterns, it still has to follow the general sense of light and shadow that you have on the model. So what I mean by that is you can't just do a normal highlighted figure, lay the pattern over top as a single color, and then stop. 
So you'll see how I'm building in the highlights onto the various raised areas and things that are more pronounced and more toward the light so that that way all of these little dots and things like that follow the same light patterns that the frog's skin that's underlying it does. Effectively, the pattern is in the same light as everything else, so it needs to heed the same highlights and shadows. And as I lay all that in, I make sure that basically it's going to feel like a credible part of the skin it's sitting on, not something completely separate. The next thing that I'm going to do, let's, so we've got the, we've got all this down. I think our pink is looking pretty good. We've got a cool pattern, but we don't have to stop there. You may have noticed I hadn't painted the leaves yet. Leaves are another thing that can oftentimes have really cool patterns in the wild. Let's use that as an opportunity here to create more noise and visual confusion and just really make this frog a cool explosion of bright colors. He's dangerous, let's make him so. I start by laying down some of the orange red. Now in this case, I didn't lay down the white first because I wanted to kind of strike out my pattern and build it up. And you'll see I wanted the orange to be a little darker. I didn't actually want a super bright intense orange. I work my way around the figure, but I'm not painting the whole leaf. I'm just kind of hashing out through stippling and, da and dabbing a basic pattern of the interior of the leaf. Doesn't need to be perfect because it doesn't matter. There is no perfect, there is no right. It just needs to be random and hashy and sort of broken up. And we'll come back to it later and adjust it multiple times. Once that's done, I use the same white we did earlier on the frog to then outline the edge of that leaf and then fill in the rest of the black space. This particular color has a much higher opacity and so it covers very easily. Basically one coat and I'm good to go. Also, this isn't my final color, so it's okay. Once I've got sort of the white pattern hashed in, you'll notice I also kind of break it up here and there, having occasional dots of that travel up into the orange for the same reasons I did it on the pink. Remember, broken up shapes where you have little dots and dashes and things like that that are outside of the full normal pattern help make the, the, uh, the entire thing more credible, more believable, because it creates more visual noise and confusion and your brain just goes, yep, that looks right to me. Once that's done, I then go to the yellow, which is a very uh, intense sort of yellow-green color, and just cover over all of my white. So this time we're going to go ahead and make it yellow to contrast brightly against uh, the rest of that orange. Uh, now, that's going to, you know, do perfectly well for us, no problem. Um, then, uh, uh, like, once that yellow's in there, it's bright, but as I looked at it, I was like, you know what, it's a little too much. That's a little too much of that intense yellow. It's drawing away. We need to soften that. So the first thing I do is grab some uh, just basically deep purple I had used earlier on the figure and uh, make some lines in the leaves to both soften the orange to capture the shadows of the deep recesses, but also to separate the individual leaves as they're kind of overlapping each other and we want to reinstantiate our dark black lines. Uh, in this case, we're just using a soft purple to quote unquote black line the differences. We're going to make this a very chromatic project, lots of hues. The next thing I do then is take some of my green, which was actually what I used on the frog's skin, and then I work in on the edge of the yellow, reducing the yellow and harmonizing those leaves with the rest of the figure. Because now there's that little touch of green that aligns with the skin, it feels more uh, overall aligned, and I don't have so much of that bright kick in yellow right down at the bottom distracting the eye. Uh, so I kind of just basically work that in everywhere, making sure that it's nice, and, uh, and, and I leave some of that yellow showing. Again, notice I'm just stippling it, hashing it, dashing it, and dotting it, using this very rough pattern to fill everything in. What's nice about this kind of a thing is you don't have to have a steady hand. You don't have to worry about getting things exactly in the lines. You can just be messy, be hashy, be scratchy. It takes you back to when you were a kid and you were just kind of stabbing paint around and having fun. That's why this is such an awesome process because it's just fun. With all of that stuff done, I wanted to talk about another use of these kinds of dots and dashes and natural patterns. On his belly, I have a little bit of a blend where I had put in this kind of soft brown tone on the shadows of the sides of his little bullfrog belly. But they're not perfect. And, you know, 
taking a, a, a this I wanted to be a quick figure. I only spent about two hours on this guy total. So doing a quick uh, blend, you know, it is what it is. It, you know, it's not perfect, but it's good enough. However, we can hide it by putting in some dots on the actual blend by using a natural pattern. And here I'm just going to use brown because I want it to be a little more neutral. I'm just using it to hide the belly blend. I just put in these dots. You know, notice I use lots of different sizes, distribution, like the size of the dots, their, their distance from each other, their positioning is random. Uh, and again, by getting those different sizes in there, it creates a lot of visual noise and confusion. I didn't fix the blend at all, and yet I covered some of it over, and now it's a lot harder to notice that the blend isn't perfect. And it makes the figure look a lot cooler, more credible, more visual interest. It's a win-win. Anytime you can use these kind of natural patterns, uh, whether it be like you're doing a creature or even something like freckles on cheeks, it can really help hide a lot of your, the sins in your painting if you're not getting your blends exactly correct. The last step with this guy is just fixing a little bit of color distribution. I have a lot of orange down at the bottom, but not much up top, and I want this guy to be pretty chromatic. So I looked at the bullfrog's eyes, and they seem to have these sort of ovular uh, irises in the center. So I filled those in off camera, and then I'm going to take that same orange from the leaf, and I go ahead and hide a little bit of it. Basically, I do the outline of his eyes in this orange tone, making sure that I'm uh, moving a little bit of that orange up on the model and distributing these bright colors evenly. This is my sort of final note and warning. When you're working and using a lot of these bright, intense colors, you want to make sure that they're kind of evenly distributed around the model, or at least they're present in multiple places. In general, think of it like a circle or a triangle, where you can have three or four places on the miniature where those colors exist that are more or less evenly distributed around the miniature. That's especially important when you're using very intense colors like reds and oranges, which tend to draw the eye very heavily. So you want to make sure that they're nice and distributed. Uh, that way the eye can keep moving and not to be stuck staring in one particular position. With that done, this guy's all set. Uh, so here's how he came out and looks right now. I think he's pretty fun, pretty cool little, little frog. Not bad for a two hour painting project. I needed a little palette cleanser. Sometimes it's fun to just sit down, spend a couple hours, and paint something really fun. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give it a like. Don't forget to subscribe. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you want to support the channel, as I mentioned, you can pick up awesome paint sets like this monument set from Rogue Hobbies down in the comments below. Uh, there's all sorts of affiliate links. None of them cost you any extra money. In fact, most of them will save you money but it helps give a little kickback to the channel and supports an awesome company in the process. If you'd also like, we've got a Patreon focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. We'd love to have you as part of the community. As always, though, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.